Hi, my name is Sharon Chen, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. In this video, I'll discuss watery diarrhea caused by bacteria. The learning objective is to recognize the clinical features of watery diarrhea and how they relate to the pathogenesis of Vibrio cholera, ETEC, and EPEC. Here is the summary table for watery diarrhea. Watery diarrhea affects the proximal small intestine. The classic example of the pathogenesis of watery diarrhea is a toxin-mediated secretory diarrhea. The main bacteria that I will discuss in this video are Vibrio cholera and a type of E. coli called Enterotoxigenic E. coli, or ETEC for short. I'll also briefly discuss other E. coli, like Enteropathogenic E. coli and Enteroaggregative E. coli. Both of these bacteria also cause watery diarrhea, but they don't make toxins. Let's start with Vibrio cholera. It causes cholera, and outbreaks are still a problem worldwide. Vibro cholera is a gram-negative curved rod with a single flagellum at one end. You can see an image of this on the slide. Vibrio lives in water. Oceans and estuaries are common sites. Many are actually commensals of fish and invertebrates. Some are pathogens. For example, Vibrio vulnificus and Vibrio parahemolyticus can cause gastrointestinal disease in humans from eating contaminated shellfish. For Vibrio cholera, very few strains are highly adapted to humans, but if they become highly adapted, they can cause outbreaks, epidemics, and even pandemics. An outbreak occurred in Haiti in 2010 after their devastating earthquake. The last pandemic was around 50 years ago. Clinically, Vibrio cholera can cause very severe watery diarrhea. Up to one liter liquid stool an hour is lost. Here's a picture of a woman in Bangladesh who is very dehydrated from cholera. You can see her sunken eyes and ill appearance. She hasn't urinated since the beginning of her infection and has had 10 hours of diarrhea and vomiting. If she is not hydrated, she will go into shock and could die within a few hours. Untreated cholera has a mortality of 30%, but it can be reduced to 1% with rehydration. To rehydrate appropriately, you need to measure how much stool is lost in order to replace that fluid. Here's a picture of this woman's watery stools. It's collected in a bucket so the amount can be measured. A typical description of the stool is that it looks like rice water. It also has a fishy odor. Stools contain 10 million to a billion bacteria per milliliter of stool. Transmission of cholera is fecal-oral. This woman drank unboiled water that was contaminated with infected human stool. Transmission is worse in outbreak situations where natural catastrophes occur, where countries have political instability, and where poverty is associated with poor infrastructure for clean water. The cholera outbreak in Haiti is a good example of high transmission because a natural catastrophe happened on top of an already poor infrastructure. Diagnosis is mostly clinical in the right setting. You can do a wet mount of stool and see Vibrio darting around under a microscope, but definitive diagnosis is with stool culture. Cholera is the only watery diarrhea where antibiotic therapy is important. It can decrease stool output by 50%. Here's the same woman with a dramatic recovery after rehydration. To cause disease, a large dose is necessary, about 100 million bacteria. It's not hard to ingest this amount because I already mentioned there are a billion bacteria per milliliter of stool. The reason you need such a large bacteria dose is because Vibrio is not well adapted to humans and they can die in the acid in your stomach. The few that survive stomach acid will need to colonize the small intestine. This occurs during the asymptomatic period. Using their flagellum, Vibrios swim, called darting motility, to get to the surface of the small intestine epithelium. If they can't reach and attach to the epithelium, they will not cause disease. One of the barriers to get to the epithelium is mucus, a physical barrier. Think of it like barbed wire. Vibrio cholera produces enzymes called mucinases that degrade the mucus so it can get to the surface of the cell. The next critical stage is attachment and this occurs through pili or fimbriae called TCP. TCP pili are also important for attaching Vibrio to each other. And this is important for the next step. The bacteria multiply on the surface of the epithelium and they grow to massive amounts on the surface. In the life cycle of a microbe, the next step is for bacteria to exit. Cholera toxin is produced as an exit strategy. It is a signal to disperse. Cholera toxin induces massive secretory diarrhea, and this is how Vibrio cholera can exit the host. 
A lot of detail is known about cholera toxin, and it exemplifies how a large class of bacterial toxins work. So I want to spend some time discussing cholera toxin because it'll help you learn about many other toxins. Cholera toxin has to get into the cell to work. First, it has to bind to receptors on the cell surface to enter, much like a virus. I'm going to zoom into the structure of cholera toxin. In the molecular model on the slide, you can see that it's made of two subunits, A and B. So it's an example of a class of toxins called AB toxin. The B subunit in all of these toxins is what binds to the cell. You can remember this as B for binding. This gives it specificity, that is where it sells, what cells it can enter. The receptor for cholera toxin is GM, a GM1, a ganglioside. The B subunit is made of several monomers that organize itself into a ring structure with a hole in the middle, as you can see in the image. The A subunit is an enzyme that activates G protein. You can remember A for active. There are other important bacterial toxins that are also AB toxins. For example, LT toxin from enteropathogenic E. coli, and I'll discuss this in the next section, sugar toxin, which I'll discuss in a different video. Other examples include pertussis toxin and whooping cough and diphtheria toxin. Now specific for cholera toxin, the B subunit binds to the receptor GM1 and gets endocytose into the cell within a vacuole. The endocytic vacuole becomes acidified, allowing the B subunit to separate from the A subunit. The A subunit moves to the cytosol through a pore created by the ring form B subunit structure. In the cytosol, the A subunit finds its target to modify the G protein. It modifies it covalently and turns it on irreversibly. The activated G protein starts a cascade of signaling that you can see in the image. A large amount of cyclic AMP is produced, which leads to phosphorylation of the chloride channel called CFTR, or Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Regulator. Phosphorylation of CFTR opens the channel, allowing chloride to escape the cell. Chloride pulls sodium with it. Now you have sodium chloride, which you know as salt. Water follows salt and the end result is watery diarrhea. Nothing else is broken in the cell except the CFTR chloride channel. This is important to know because bypassing the CFTR pathway could fix things. The good news is that there is a fix. Another channel is available called the glucosodium co-transporter. This channel can bring glucose and sodium back into the cell and then water follows. We can give a person glucose and sodium through a solution, and it's called oral rehydration solution, or ORS. Oral rehydration solution has saved countless lives. The development of oral rehydration solution was based on the knowledge about cholera toxin and cholera pathogenesis. A recurring theme is that many virulence factors, like toxins, are acquired by bacteria via horizontal gene transfer. Vibrio acquired the cholera toxin gene from a bacterial phage, which is a virus that infects bacteria. Now that you understand cholera, I want to discuss another bacteria that causes watery diarrhea with a similar mechanism. But this one you'll see more often than cholera. The bacteria is enterotoxigenic E. coli. Enterotoxigenic E. coli, or ETEC for short, is a gram-negative rod with flagella. You can see an image of it on the slide. With rotavirus, it is the most common cause of diarrhea in children. It is also the main cause of traveler's diarrhea. Perhaps you've heard the saying, boil it, cook it, peel it, or forget it. If you don't do these things, you might get traveler's diarrhea. Unlike cholera, it didn't acquire the virulence factor through a bacteriophage. It got it from a plasmid. The plasmid allows ETEC to make pili to attach to the surface of the cell and to make two toxins, which results in secretory diarrhea. These two toxins are called LT and ST for labile and stable toxins. LT toxin is almost identical to cholera toxin. It has an A and B subunit and functions the same way as cholera toxin. It is labile because it's a big protein and if boiled, it'll inactivate the toxin. The ST toxins are small peptides and if boiled, they refold and remain active and stable. Here's a diagram of what ST toxin does. The end result should look familiar. It opens the CFTR chloride channel. The cell signaling path is slightly different compared to cholera toxin, as you can see in the image. Why is CFTR, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator, targeted? 
Cystic fibrosis is the result of genetic mutations commonly seen in people of European descent. These mutations are found in the gene for CFTR. If you have one mutated CFTR gene and one good copy of the CFTR gene, you will not have cystic fibrosis. Animals with a mutated CFTR gene have less diarrhea from cholera and enterotoxigenic E. coli infections. The potential survival advantage may be why CFTR mutations are so prevalent. Let's now discuss the other E. coli that cause watery diarrhea. These bacteria are enteropathogenic E. coli and enteroaggregative E. coli. These two bacteria affect the cell surface to cause disease in contrast to Vibrio cholera and enterotoxigenic E. coli, which produce toxin to cause disease. I'm going to focus the rest of uh, the discussion on enteropathogenic E. coli. It's important to understand enteropathogenic E. coli because it's closely related to bacteria that cause inflammatory diarrhea, which I'll talk about in a separate video. Enteropathogenic E. coli, or EPEC for short, is an important cause of watery diarrhea in infants in developing countries. It attaches via pili, but then it has another trick. It evolves something else by horizontal gene transfer, something called a pathogenicity island. You can see it represented in the bacteria image on the slide. It's that red portion of the genetic material. In this island are genes that encode a tiny microscopic needle called a type 3 secretion system. This little molecular device is embedded in the envelope of the bacteria, and it's used to inject things into the host cell. One of the things that it injects is a high affinity receptor. It allows the bacteria to very tightly bind to the cell surface in addition to help from pili. Think of Velcro when you imagine this binding. The pathogenesis of EPEC is incredibly sophisticated, so I want to show you step by step what happens. Here's a diagram of EPEC attaching to the cell and inserting the type 3 secretion system. Through the microscopic needle, it injects a high affinity receptor and it injects effector proteins that destroy the microvilli, causing the cytoskeleton to create a pedestal. The end structure is called an attachment and effacement lesion. EPEC also injects other proteins that loosens up the tight junctions between cells. The destruction of the microvilli and the loosening of the tight junctions between cells contributes to the production of watery diarrhea. Here are electron micrographs of human duodenal biopsy tissue showing EPEC bound to an attachment and effacement lesion. You can see the bacteria on top of a pedestal in the top image and many bacteria attached to the surface of cells on the bottom image.